Our Heavenly Father, you're with us as well. We're here to worship our God and hear from our God and, and uh, dig into his word. Amen. It's awesome to be in fellowship with the saints. Father God, we just invite you into this place this morning. and We just want to open our hearts, lift our holy hands, lift our voices to you, Father God, and prepare our hearts to hear from your word, Father. So as we sing these songs to you, may you receive them, may you be blessed, and uh, may we draw ever closer, closer to you in these last days, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing of your love. Amen. Amen. Praise God. My feet may fail me, my hands may shake, my life may crumble, my heart may break, but through the darkness, you are the light, I know forever, you hold my trial, faithful through the night, everything I need is in you. My faith may falter, my hope may fade, my voice may tremble. My fear may wait, but through my failures, your mercies rise. I know forever, you're on my side. in 
in the trial Faithful through the night Everything I need is in you Amen. He is good all the time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Worship you, God, the way, the truth, and the life. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion. You are my hiding place I believe you are the way The truth The life I believe you are the way The truth The life I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take, I believe that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love, Lord. I believe you are the way. The truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are. Yes, Lord. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to, because they can't stay long when I am here with you. It's a new horizon. And I'm set on you And you meet me here today With mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay alone When I believe you are The way The truth The light The way, the truth, the light, it's a new horizon, it's a new horizon, and I'll sit on you, and you meet me here today, with mercies that are new, all my fears and doubts. They can all come to because they can't stay alone when I am healing. Oh, yeah. Amen. He is indeed. We thank you, Lord Jesus. See in there the great 
indeed I am A crown of thorns upon his head The Father's heart dismayed for us Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Lift it up on Calvary's hill. We cursed your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise, endless hallelujahs to your holy name. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Offer up this sacrifice. For every sin, our Savior died. The Lord of life can be contained. Our God has risen from the grave. Oh, our God has risen from the grave. Behold. The story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise. Endless hallelujahs to your holy name. Jesus, you will reign. We'll see your face bright as the sun. We'll bow before the King of Kings. Oh God, forever we will sing. Behold the Lamb. Story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Behold the Lamb. The story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign. Victory is his. Praise you, God.
you. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to breathe Something that will That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song A song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless words And no one could express How much you deserve and Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you Yes, it is It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I need And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song Yes, we do And it's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song And it's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song Yes, it is And it's all about you, Jesus I'll bring you more than a song I'll bring you more than a song 
And it's all about you, Jesus. Sorry, Lord, for making it so tonight. It's all about you, Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. These songs that we sing, Lord God, I pray that it draws us closer to you, that it helps us to understand and sing out how much love that we have for you in our hearts and what you've done for us. It's all about you. It's all about worshiping our creator, the creator of the heavens and the earth, our creator who sent his son, Jesus, to die for us, that we could be forgiven and renewed and strengthened day by day as we seek you. And this morning, as we dig into your word, Father God, I pray that it would change us from the inside out. Father, in these, in these dark, dark times that keep getting darker, that we know that your word says it's going to happen that way, I pray that you would help us be more of a light, help us to shine brighter for Jesus in these times. It's so difficult we can get our eyes focused on other things around us, but help us to keep our eyes focused on you. This is just a vapor. This life is a vapor. We have eternity that is waiting for us, and we never know when we're going to be called home. So while it's still called today, may we be about your business, preaching the gospel, being salt and light in this world. We love you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name for this time that we could just draw near to you during this time of worship and be with us now as we hear from your word. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. We love you, Lord. We give you praise. Praise God. Greet someone in the love of the Lord next to you. We'll have some announcements and be right in the Word.
Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Blessed Hope Chapel. Praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. We'll let you guys get into your seats. We just got a few announcements for you today and some praying, of course, that we'll do together uh, for the service. But uh, hopefully everyone is doing well this morning. Um, we are excited about a number of things that are going on. We know that the summer is here and there are a ton of different things that we got going, specifically baptisms that are coming up. I know some people are very excited about that. We've had a number of people visit and asking about baptism, so it's nice to be able to set some dates. So let's get right into that. Um, we are meeting every Wednesday now for both the high school and the middle school groups. We're meeting up together on Wednesday nights and then we're separating uh, after we do worship together. And we actually meet up there at 715. So if you want to come here, and Joe's been doing a series through 1 Timothy that I don't think you guys want to miss. So if you have some kids at that age and you're like, or even at a younger age as well, and you're like, yeah, but Wednesdays it can be tough because trying to watch them while watching this and so forth. Guys, it is a great time to dig into 1 Timothy on Wednesday night. Throw your kids up there and we will hopefully not throw them back too much different outside of what Jesus has done to them. Um, for the last two weeks, we've been dealing about what the gospel is. And then for the next six weeks, we're kind of doing an intensive on how to share the gospel and also some apologetics uh, for the young people. And we got a nice crew of leaders that are helping teach that a number of people. And then on the 25th, it culminates with us doing a trip out to Huntington Beach to share the gospel and then also do some campfire worship and stuff. So hopefully, if you're high school or middle school age, we'd love to have you guys up there this Wednesday night, 715. Uh, also, home fellowships. Uh, I don't know. The, the Schimmels are meeting on Sunday, May 22nd. The Coopers are meeting on Friday, May 27th. But I know for us, we're going to be switching the date around. So if you're in the Hanessian group that we're in, uh, make sure that we have your number, that you're in the text message group so we can tell you, hey, we're actually going to be meeting on this date. So I know because I know the date is moving. Uh, as I, I as I had mentioned in the beginning, we are doing baptism. So mark this down in your calendar, July 10th. If you have not been baptized yet, we would love to have you guys sign up for baptism. That's if you're saved, of course. If you're not saved, please don't get baptized. Uh, that'd be a waste of time for everyone there. But if you do know the Lord, it, it's a great time to get baptized. And if you want to know what baptism really really about, we do have a teaching for you called Believer's Baptism that you guys can get a hold of and check that out. But that's going to be July. 10th. We usually go there not long after service. We meet, we make a day of it, and it's a really awesome time, uh, not just for those who are getting baptized, but for us as a body to celebrate that baptism because it is an important, important step in your walk with Christ. So really excited about that. Guys, the men's retreat is coming up really really fast. Every time uh, we meet on Sunday, I'm like, oh wow, men's retreat is coming up. And then next thing you know, it's going to be here. Remember, it is June 2nd to the 5th. You got to get your payments in. The amount, the total is almost due. And May 15th, that is the deadline that if you want a men's retreat t-shirt, finally we're bringing those back. That's awesome. Uh, I'm excited about that. If you want a men's retreat t-shirt, make sure that you uh, let them know and put your size in there. And for the women's retreat, there are a couple of different prices depending upon if you're there for two nights or three nights. All the details are down here below. And also we wanted to say Blessed Hope Texas. They've been doing, uh, they're doing a fundraiser for the foundation that they're trying to pour now in the next month or so. And Mark Hess over here has been helping out James. He's just been a wealth of knowledge for him to get everything set so they can build their barn church there. And if you guys want to help out in any way, you can do that. You can go to blessedhopetexas.org. One of the ways, uh, you can even buy some gear that just says Blessed Hope Texas or Doctor Matters. There's some t-shirts, some hats, and so forth. And then the proceeds go to building the foundation there. You just go to blessedhopetexas.org and go over to the thing that says shop and click on it. If you wanted to check that out. And uh, this is one last announcement. This is kind of a, I guess, the, the pre-announcement for it because we just got some of the details down, but we're actually doing a Good Fight Youth Conference. Uh, not just a conference, actually, a Good Fight Youth Retreat in Pennsylvania in August. So we're actually pretty excited about this. We're going to be doing an entire retreat from ages 14 to 19, and we're going to be just te teaching on 
all love and discernment from Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And we're really excited about it. Like I said, we don't have all the details to put out. We'll have it all set up for you guys next week in terms of wanting to know. But we, we are really excited to be able to, to get going and, and have this uh, opportunity to have an entire week of teaching out in Pennsylvania and a whole retreat with the youth. So really excited about that. And I, I know I, I can't wait to get into the Word with you guys. We're going to be taking an offering for the needs of the church and also for so many different ministries that we're able to bless through this little fellowship here. It's wonderful. God is doing so many amazing things. And so uh, if you guys can bow your hearts with me and uh, we could pray about that and also for the message today, that'd be wonderful. Dear me, Father, Lord, I thank you so much just for what you've done in each and every one of our lives, the fact that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die a horrible death on our behalf, Lord, for the crimes that we've committed. We thank you so much for that, Lord. I pray uh, for our church, Lord, that you would grow us, Lord, that you would grow us, most importantly, spiritually, Lord, that we would grow closer to you, that we would lean on you, Lord. We ask that all the finances that come in through this church will be used for your glory every single cent, Lord, and that more and more people will come to know your son Jesus, Lord, and that we would ultimately show shine him, Lord, that causes others, maybe in our workplace or uh, at sports with our kids, whatever it may be, Lord, that you have us in. Lord, have us there and have people ask us the question, why do we have the hope within us? And help us be ready to give a defense for the hope that you've given us in the cross of Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord, guys. All right, praise the Lord, everybody. A lot of cool announcements there. Men, uh, we always have an awesome time up there, so make that a retreat. Uh, people come back radically transformed, and they come back raving about how beautiful the mountains are. Is it right the sisters are going up there this year or pretty soon? Am I right? You guys are in for a treat. <laughs> Man, it's, uh, it's worth a drive. I think all the men agree with that. Maybe one or two through the years have been like, oh man, it's a long way, but they get up there, they're like stoked. All right, uh, any praise reports as we finish the offering? Just want to give glory to God for something he's done in your life. Toby, you have something? Your mom's pointing at you. Oh, I, I turned 14 on Thursday. You turned 14 on Thursday. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> praise the Lord, Toby. I see new peach fuzz, man, on your cheeks there. <laughs> praise God. Any other praise reports? All right, let's uh, seek the Father in prayer. Father in heaven, we are just so happy, Father, to be here on the Lord's Day, the day that you've made, Father, the first day of the week, uh, the very day, Father, uh, a Sunday, Father, when your son rose from the dead, Father, and uh, conquered death a Sunday so many years ago. And we're grateful that we get together on the first day of the week and give you praise and glory and honor. And we thank you, Father, that uh, we have the freedom in this country to assemble without being persecuted to the point of death as it is in some countries, Lord, Muslim nations and some communistic nations and or in prison like in communist China, Father, or uh, in prison and sometimes put to death in Islamic nations, Father. We just thank you, Father, for the freedom we have and we pray that we wouldn't take it for granted. Father, we see the writing on the wall. We see what your, your word says as well, which uh, is absolute, Father, that greater persecution is coming. So we just pray, Father, in your son's name that we would stand up for righteousness. We stand up for your son. We stand up for what's right, Father, in, in Christ. And, and preach his kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Preach the Christ crucified and risen. And we pray, Father, that as we get into your word, that we'd be strengthened to go through the trials that we face as believers right now and for the future as well. In your son's name we pray to your glory. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We are just doing the second part of a message called Expect Unexpected Trials. And we did part one of that a couple weeks back. And I want to do part two of that, and then we'll continue to finish up in the book of Revelation. Uh, and every once in a while we'll have some topical studies like this. I like to weave in a lot of practical, you know, devotional type messages in the midst of, you know, Revelation, because we've been kind of going back and forth and 
Truth be told, we've been way more into devotional, practical message than the book of Revelation itself. We got back to it, but uh, Christmas and came, and then the holidays, and then uh, Resurrection Sunday, and so forth. We did some holiday messages focused on Christ's death and resurrection, amen? So, uh, and we'll continue that series off and on as well, because I have a series we've been doing as well called uh, How Christ Suffered Hell on the Cross for Us, which is really mind-blowing when you think about it. When he died on the cross, he suffered the wrath that we deserved, and we get your brain around that. It makes you really appreciate who he is and what he's done for you far more than thinking he just died physically or just died as some martyr. He died as a substitutionary atonement for our sins, amen, and took our sin upon himself, and it's just precious, and that's why we love him. We love him because he made us in his image, amen, and he created us to love him back and respond to him, but we also love him because he gave himself for us, and it's a beautiful, most beautiful love story ever told. Hollywood, no one can touch it. In fact, they try to copy it at times, but they really can't get their brains around it even. So right now, we're looking at our trials. Now, you guys, how many, anybody here ever go through a trial? All of us, right? Every person goes through trials. You know, what the scripture says, the sparks fly upward, like when you drive, drag a piece of metal. So man is born unto trials, right? And we looked at last time, when you encounter various trials, not if you encounter various trials. Amen. It's going to happen. And all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you're not being persecuted and you've been a Christian for some time and you don't go, nobody ever gives you a hard time, uh, it might be because you're not proclaiming his name the way you ought to be. Amen. You're not offending people. Now you just don't go out of your way and say, man, how can I offend that guy over there? You know? No, you go to show the love of Christ and what the Lord's done for you because we are called to love the lost. You know, I had a message last week where we talked quite a bit about loving the lost and recognizing and remembering that we also once were lost, amen, and that we don't get hard hearts toward them. And that was in the, uh, as Chad mentioned, you want to check out, if you can, midweek study. Uh, we're going through First Timothy, which is, has a lot of really good practical messages for our walks with Jesus and uh, understanding the mystery of the Lord and what he's doing. Now, it's interesting. We went through First Peter 4, 12 through 12 and 13 a little bit, and we're going through this, uh, these verses and we, it, we looked at uh, about four of the ten ways. Uh, this was called, you know, expecting unexpected trials. And when you go to 1 Peter 4, uh, we looked at a few of them already. I think I got through four of them. And let's go ahead and read those verses. 1 Peter chapter 4. I think I may be the only one not there now. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, that's you and me. He's writing to the beloved that we're alive in those days, but it's also written for us as we read in Scripture. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you, which comes upon you for your testing. Don't be shocked. As though some strange thing were happening to you. Like, I can't believe. I'm a Christian, and I'm, I became following Jesus. How come I'm going through hard times? Well, it's the opposite. You should be thinking, since I'm a Christian, and I'm identifying with the one who gave himself for me, the one who loved my soul, my maker, my redeemer, of course I'm going to go through hard times because they... People hate God. The flesh is in rebellion to God. Verse 13, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Or as one translation says, with exceeding joy. And the first four things we looked at, we had a whole service on this. And I, I've been praying that you'd be blessed, you know. And we praise God for our different live stream groups that are watching right now in the different states and sometimes we mention several states and we leave out a bunch of others but we love all of you guys and the different people that are watching from around the world we love you guys and we praise God that you have a, a conviction to truly follow the Lord Jesus Christ and, and our prayer is to bless everybody here and everybody uh, that watches these watches them later and, or given them passed on or whatever There's a, we're, we're, in, we're, we're preaching God's word man his truth and we, we want to dive into his truth and let it transform us amen so the first thing we looked at, because we're looking at 10 ways or 10 ways and reasons to make sure to help us rejoice in our trials. Because we're commanded to rejoice in our trials. We looked at that last time, James chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5. And there's various, there's a few different places, several places actually that tell us to rejoice in our trials. I remember I was going through the book of James and I think in the, when I first hit rejoice in our trials, I think I did a whole service because there's so many verses that encourage us to rejoice in the attitude we're to have in our trials. Well, I'm looking at these few verses with you in 1 Peter chapter 
4, verses 12 and following that show us why. God's just not saying, you know, just rejoice for the sake of rejoicing. He gives us reasons to rejoice. He's a reasonable God. Come, let us reason together, he says. Amen. There's reasons we rejoice. If you don't understand the reasons that you are to rejoice, you'll try to be happy during your trial, but you won't understand why, and you'll just drop back into a funk of depression or hopelessness or despair. We all go through trials. We all go through tribulations. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Ooh, there's one reason, because he's overcome the world, right? It's all over the place. That's why we need to make sure our head is in God's word when we're going through hard times, that we're focused on the Lord, because when we're going through hard times, we focus on ourselves or the circumstances or, or people that just don't have a right spirit around us and so forth. We're just going to collapse. And right now, the suicide rate is just, I don't know if you've seen the statistics, continue to be reported upon. They're just spiking right now. Okay? All over the place. Uh, and it's absolutely heartbreaking. And I've gotten into some of those statistics in past messages. Did a whole message on suicide a couple years back. I'll probably revisit that again because it's epidemic proportions right now. And, but, but millions of people don't commit suicide, but they feel like it. They just feel like leaving this world at times, you know? Or they just, you know, how many times a Christian, you're like, Lord, just take me home, you know? I mean, I think we've all felt that way at certain times, right? <laughs> But the Lord has plans for us, and he wants us to act on his word. So the first thing we looked at, when we looked at the, and I'll just go over the first four of the, fir, of the ten, and I'll, I won't take more than a minute on either of them. The first thing we looked at is verse 12, beloved, that very first word. And when I said, Lord, I want to come up with how many ways, whatever amount of ways in this text, and I came out with round number 10. Beloved, we are beloved. He loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The whoever believes him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He's loved the whole world. But when you come to Christ, you become part of the beloved. That's even more than just being loved. That's being beloved in Christ. Jesus said, Father, you've loved them with the same love with which you've loved me. Get your brain around that. You know how much father, the Father loves his son? Whew. Father, you've loved them. The believers as much in the same way that you've loved me. Number two, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal, God bless you, among you, fiery trial or ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Again, Christians sometimes, many, they, they, they hear the gospel or a version of the gospel, oftentimes the false presentation of the gospel on popular Christian TV stations, and all of a sudden they, they're told, God wants you rich and wealthy and healthy, and they like, sign me up. And then they go through horrible times when they start to commit themselves to Christ. And they're like, what's going on? This isn't what I signed up for. And in times of trial, it says in persecution, they fall away. And they're, because they're shocked. Well, right here, we're told in the scriptures, we're not supposed to be surprised when we go through trials. We're not supposed to be shocked, like what's going on? We should expect them. Do you understand that? Say, this is part of being a Christian, amen? And by the way, even the wicked, the Bible says hard is the way of the wicked. It's hard for the non-believer too. They just don't have Jesus. They just don't have salvation. Far, it's ugly. For us, it's beautiful because of what the Lord is doing. Number three, he tells us that this is happening for the testing of our faith, okay? This is a test, amen? We are being tested. We talk about, I tried to, you know, I shared with you that I always love the fact that we have the best teacher in the universe. We have God, amen? The Holy Spirit is our counselor, the third person of the triune God. He's our comforter, amen? And praise God. God, it's the test that we have, open book test I love open book test thank you Jesus amen. amen oh and guess what the teacher is with us we talked about amen teacher's like oh you need the answer we pray ask and you know if you lack wisdom ask we have to ask the teacher hey what's the answer to this oh it's this oh, oh praise God oh I made a mistake though oh guess what I can forgive you for that mistake and, and, and let you give another answer now come on you guys there's no reason to fail in this test amen and number four, he wants us to remember that it'll all be worth it in the end. Amen? It'll all be worth it in the end. Verse 13, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. There's going to be incredible joy at the end of it all. Amen? Amen? Incredible. You'll be so thankful that you persevered in the end and you continued to hold fast to the faith in Christ. Amen? don't throw in the towel. It's not worth it. This life is a vapor, as I often remind you, because I just tell you what the scriptures say. 
It's like a hand's breadth. It's, compared to eternity, it's nothing. It says it's as nothing as well. Compared to eternity. Why would you take what's like a vapor compared to eternity and blow it? Makes no sense at all. And then suffer for eternity, which is unending, because you've rejected Christ and you've been sent into a Christless eternity, exactly what you wanted to do your own thing and be separate from him. Don't do that. Number five. This is a new one now. Number five. He wants you to remember you are blessed. Verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, reviled, persecuted, talked evil about, hurt, if you are reviled for the name of Christ because of Jesus' name, you are what? You are blessed. You are blessed, man. I love that. You are blessed. Now, how many of you want to be blessed versus cursed? I mean, there's curses and there's blessings. I want to be blessed, amen? And you're blessed when you suffer for Christ. And you have to keep that in mind. That makes the suffering a whole lot easier. Also keep in mind, you know, he doesn't allow you to be tested or tempted beyond what you're able but with a temptation or trial, he'll give you a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Amen? So if you seek Christ, it's never going to be too much. God never lets us go through too much in Christ. Amen? He has things in the way he's created the fabric of creation to where we can't go through too much. Now, we can act like it's too much, but he's promised that it won't be too much for us if we seek him. I mean, even the body, when you're tortured... You can only go through so much pain before you go into shock and you can't even feel anything anymore. Okay? I mean, it's just interesting how God's made it. He's, you got to trust him, right? So we are blessed. In fact, 1 Peter 2, 19 and 20, a couple of chapters earlier, he states this, For if anyone endures the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God, this is to be commended. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. I like the way the NLT puts it. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. Amen? It blesses God's heart. It's not, he's not some abstract being out there. We're not deists. He's personal. He knows every hair in our head. They're numbered. He cares for us. He sees when the sparrow falls to the ground, Jesus says. And the sparrows, he said, are sold for pennies in our vernacular. He says, how much more does he care for you, your father, who are made in his image? So he personally cares. He knows what you're going through. Remember when Antipas, he was persecuted to the point of death when Jesus addressed the seven churches. And Jesus brings him up by name. Antipas, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. He knew his name. Remember when Stephen was being stoned to death in Acts chapter 7? And he confessed Christ as he stoned to death. He refused to deny his name. And Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before God in heaven. But if you confess me before name, I'll confess you before the Father in heaven. What was Jesus doing? Do you remember? Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. That's really strange. Because we read over and over again right now that Jesus is what? Seated, Seated at the right hand of the Father. But the implication is, is that Jesus stood up to honor him. That's powerful. You have to see the bigger picture. You have to see beyond this physical world. We were praying with our, and giving a little devotion. I was telling a little story with our, some of our grandkids yesterday. Actually, I think it was uh, Russell and the, the girls at that point. No, I think Eli was with us too. Yeah, Eli was with us too because he wanted to chase a giant lizard up on a wall because we were parked after one of their games and we took the grand girls and uh, Eli and Russ and and uh, we're praying and, and then Ariella says Pop up, how can we pray to God when we can't see him you know and Lisa goes that's a good question Ariella and we explained it to her and I said see that tree over there the tree right by the lizard where they had been looking and the leaves were blowing pretty nice I go can you see that wind can you see the wind no I go, is there wind there though? She goes, yeah. I go, how can you see, how do you know there's wind there? Because I can see it blowing the leaves. I go, yeah, there's, we believe in things we can't see with our eyes because we can see the, what they cause, the effect, right? And they're all like in agreement, yeah. I mean, how many of you got colds this year and you can't see the virus, you know? <laughs> see, there's some bad things out there too. There's 
bad spiritual things too, principalities and powers. But I said, only God, only a, only a mind can write a book, right? And I said, the information that's written in you, I didn't get into the depth, it would lose her, you know. The DNA that's written in you is everything about you had to be written. And we didn't write it, did we? No. I go, can you have a building without a builder? No. Painting without a painter? No. Creation without a creator? No. She goes, no. And then she was all excited. And she wanted to pray more, you know. We prayed more. And, and uh, But you guys, we have to see the Lord in the things that we go through. And I love that he's pleased with you. And now and we're blessed. How are we blessed? One of the ways that we're blessed, you know, is I'll talk about ways that we're blessed presently and ways that we're blessed eternally. One way we're blessed is that we share in Christ's sufferings. Okay, you're in good company when you suffer for Christ. Amen? Because he suffered for us. And, and if you back up to verse 13, it says, but to the degree that you share the what? You what? Share. You participate in the sufferings of Christ. Keep on rejoicing, right? So, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. So we share in his sufferings. God became a man to suffer for us, for our sins. We don't share in those sufferings, but he suffered for righteousness sake and we identify with him. Amen? And the word share right there in the Greek is koinoneo and that's from, you know, that's related to the word koinonia. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, Greek word, koinonia. And it means fellowship, participation. You know, I love the word koinonia. The word fellowship sounds kind of fellow, kind of, kind of strange, you know, fellowship. But it's a good word when you understand what it means, right? But I love koinonia, man. Koinoneo, well, we share in his sufferings. And we are, as I said, in good company. Because listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, says Jesus. You're blessed. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Awesome. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of th uh, evil uh, against you because of me. Okay? When people are persecuting because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Now, they're not going to persecute you because of the name of Christ if you don't lift up the name of Jesus. Amen? But you want to be blessed? Lift up the name of Jesus. But don't say, I want to lift up the name of Jesus because I want to be blessed. Lift the name of Jesus because his name is worthy of being lifted up. Amen? Because he made you and he gave, he gave us life and he died for us. But guess what? A consequence of that is being blessed. Then verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. Why does Jesus emphasize that? Because that's the last thing we think of doing when we're going through hard times. But you can do it because there's many cases throughout Scripture where they rejoiced when they were being persecuted. There's a number of times through Acts in the New Testament where you see that the believers are doing that. And many of us have done that because we realize, praise God. Praise God because I know I'm in God's will. Paul said when you're persecuted for his name's sake in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it's a token that you've been counted worthy of his name. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. Mega great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you in other words guess what the prophets that were persecuted before you that we read about jeremiah he was persecuted heavily thrown in a pit left for dead isaiah you know some uh, church history has him mentions him being sawn in two uh, they were persecuted the prophets who were before you but you enter into koinonia specifically with jesus philippians 3 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. This was Paul's prayer, man. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Wow. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. We rejoice, man, that, man, with the, the fellowship of his resurrection. Awesome. But guess what? Comes before the fellowship of the resurrection. Fellowship of his sufferings. Man, as New Testament Christians, they knew what that was about. And we can't foil, we can't fall under the minimal persecution compared to what they went, they're going through, not only then, in the past, but they're going through right now, throughout the, the world. A lot of Christians are being persecuted. Now, it's interesting. I mentioned that you're in good company when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, and you're blessed, it says, 
because you enter into the sufferings of Christ, but you're also in bad company if you are a wimpy, professing Christian and are afraid to ever say anything about Jesus because you don't want to offend anybody. Okay? And you lack love in two counts then. If you're refusing, I'm not saying you don't go through hard times, you don't struggle, you say, Lord, I'm talking about you just never want to say anything about Jesus because you're just like, I'm going to be a, you know, a spy for Jesus and just nobody will really know who I am because I'm a special agent and I can't handle persecution. That ain't right. Jesus said, Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Woo, man, that's pretty crazy, huh? Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, because that's how your fathers spoke of the false prophets. Wow. So those preachers who don't want to convict people, don't want to ruffle feathers, that suffer from the de disease we call non rockabotis or you can call it non rockabotitis if you want, uh, they're in trouble. I've mentioned to you before that a lot of preaching takes place today and I mentioned Robert Schuller, who was a top preacher in this country decades ago, literally took out of amazing grace for, and save a wretch like me, took the word wretch out, and they put one in, save a one like me. Because they don't want people to think of themselves as sinners. And I mentioned to you guys, I don't know what week it was, but uh, Sister Lori, you know, in our fellowship, they moved to Arizona, her and Clark, love those guys, Lord bless them. Um, that she said that she didn't know she was in the choir and everything she grew up in that whole church she never knew she was a sinner that needed, needed Christ for her for salvation and forgiveness through Christ because of her sin and that's horrific guys we can't do that and people do that they tone down the message of the gospel and the conviction of sin to reach more people for their message it's not the message of Christ and we have to make sure we're not doing that amen that, that we're, not, we're not saying, oh, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm going to preach just a, a feel-good Jesus. A feel-good Jesus who doesn't deal with your sin is a false Jesus, guys. We're blessed. And we've got to remember that when we're getting persecuted, that we're blessed. You know? That, that we're blessed, man. We are blessed. And I've been on the streets a lot of times, you know, and sharing the gospel through the years. And I still share it everywhere. Often share the gospel just with people I run into and stuff and uh, you know you go through persecution sometimes you know not usually but you can go through some but we go through nothing compared you know in, in an Islamic nation many Islamic nations you start preaching Jesus it's against you know Muslim law Sharia law in the, in the you know uh, depend, whether you're you know depends on what country you're in but you can die especially if you're an ex-Muslim and you've turned to Jesus, that's punishable by death. Do you know that? And many, many Christians who were formerly Muslims have been killed through the years and are still being killed to this day. So we have it way easier, you guys. You know? And I got a little taste. I got a little taste of feeling, having a sense of I'm going to be stoned to death. And I got a little taste of what the apostles went through. Just a little taste. And I, I've shared that in the past with some of you. Uh, but... It's worth telling. I'll tell a short version of the story. I was going street with him, witnessing on Ben Yehuda Street, which is kind of like our third street when we go witnessing out there. And Ben Yehuda Street is bustling with just a lot of energy and excitement, named after the guy that restored the Hebrew language to the Jewish people after it had been missing for a long time. And, uh, and that was prophesied to happen too, that they'd recover their old language. And I was witnessing, but we'd go up with people who were staying at Christ Church at the time, and we'd go up there and share the gospel, and sure enough, uh, I ran into a guy at a, at a, a Christian bookstore, Bible Society bookstore, uh, which Ted turned us on to. And Victor, the guy that is a big part of the Bible Society out there, a great Jewish man, beautiful man of the Lord. But I, there was a guy working there, and the Jewish guy working there just was, was happy to see I was getting books on witnessing to Jews, you know. And he was like, I'm happy you're getting these books because a lot of Christians come and they just want tour stuff. And the people are perishing because I said, hey, I want to witness the Jews better and, you know, and so forth. And he's like, wow, this is exciting. He goes, because I go, yeah, I don't think the Apostle Paul would come here and hang out and not want to witness to people, <laughs> you know. So when we have our trips, we go witnessing when we go to Israel. So if you want to go to Israel, one of the things we do is we go at least pass out tracts and share the gospel. Amen. Anyways, 
He said, hey, I said, we're going witnessing. Da -da. You want to come? He said, yeah, I'd love to come. So he came, and we became witnessing partners up there, and we're sharing the gospel together. And i got to shorten the story, but it got pretty gnarly because we were surrounded about, uh, uh, by guys that had shirts that said in Hebrew, anti-missionaries. They were anti-missionary Orthodox Jewish zealots. And they were young, fiery guys. Remember how fiery the Apostle Paul was before he became a Christian? <laughs> we just looked at his testimony last, last Wednesday night as the chief of sinners. If you didn't hear that message, check it out. And we looked at his testimony. He was having Christians killed. Well, if they could have Christians killed legally, probably wouldn't be here right now. Anyway, they're surrounded us. They have their walkie-talkies and everything. And man, I had a guy on the hook being fishers of men, right? A Jewish guy that came back to hear us a second time when I'd seen him another place witnessing and he wanted to hear more. I was giving him typologies. It was blowing his mind. He was seeing Christ throughout the Old Testament. He was getting so close and they surrounded him like, and then they said, hey, we can't talk to this guy anymore. He's one of the Orthodox Jews, da da da, da. Hands off. You know, he's one of our guys because he's an Orthodox Jewish young kid. But young, maybe 20 years old, right? If you're 20 and you're my age, you're a whippersnapper, man. So it goes quick, though. So if you're 20, you say, yeah, I don't want In a blink, I'm here. Boom, you're, you, you grow old. Stay close to Jesus. And as I'm talking to him, he goes, he was getting closer. And then they shut it down. And then my buddies, were, they're engaging. Now they're talking Hebrew. I don't know what they're saying. So I just mosey over while they're all talking and start witnessing them again. Because, man, I got him. It's like having that big fish. It's like just one more big tug. Maybe I get him up, right? And then my buddy's like, no, no. He kept saying, I, I said, I better honor what he's saying, uh, my buddy, because they're talking Hebrew. I don't know exactly what's going on here. And he said, we got to go. So then they walked us out, a bunch of these guys, right? A few right by us and a few back walking, like a little mob. And I was like, wow, man. <laughs> and they started punching my buddy as we're walking. Bam. Not in the face. One big guy with a walkie-talkie started punching him in the shoulder over and over again. It weren't hitting me. And I don't know if it's because I'm an American or because I'm bigger, okay? But they weren't punching me, and I was like, you know, and I was like, and I told the guy to stop it. Hey, stop that. And he did it. Did it again. And then all of a sudden, we had a bunch of them following us, you know? And these, they're blinded. They don't understand the gospel, right? And then I stopped. I turned around and stopped as they're right there, and they all stopped. And because he, they're still hitting them, and I didn't know how to stop it. I wasn't going to grab the guy and throw him on the ground because that wouldn't be a good witness for Jesus. Amen? Plus, there were 20 of them. I don't know if it would have been smart, but my, it came in my mind, you know. But I stood up, like, you know, almost in an antagonistic way, like, hey, back off. And I said, back off. Leave us alone. You know, quit hitting him. And you know what he said? And he was the guy getting hit. He goes, and now keep in mind, there's a time one of them picked up a piece of asphalt to stone us to death, and a couple of the other guys stopped him, Okay. There's a lot going on here. And I'm like, oh, they want to stone us. At least some of them do. And that's when I felt a little bit like, woo, that's what Paul felt like. So I'm like, man, we could die tonight, you know? And, I, and you know what? He said, Joe, the guy that's getting hit, he goes, Joe, we're blessed. Because he was just, we're just walking. And I didn't know what he was going through. I just felt so bad for him. He goes, Joe, we're blessed. We're blessed, Joe. I'm like, and I remembered Jesus' words, blessed are you. And I knew we were blessed, but he just didn't look like he was feeling too blessed at the moment, you know. And uh, then we turned back around, and we kept walking. And then all of a sudden, he goes, and I know we're supposed to turn right to go to Christ Church, but he didn't want them to know where we're going. So he turned left, and uh, he goes, let's go this way. I go, okay. And this is a funny part of the story. They all stopped like they hit a wall, and all were looking like they're bummed out. And I'm like, why, why did they just all just stop? I'm thinking it's because I was like. <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking that, actually. But i like, why did they all stop? And he goes, because that happened like five minutes earlier. I go, why did they all stop? He goes, because we just entered into the Muslim neighborhood. It's called the Muslim Quarter. And they can't go in the Muslim Quarter or they'd be persecuted. We worked our way through the Muslim Quarter. Then this uh, uh, Muslim guy came up to us named Akbar. No, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. We just went straight to, straight to the church. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been pretty cool to you, but the story ends there. We just went back to the church. <laughs> oh, Lord, not that I'm asking for any of that, Lord. but uh, So he reminded me, yeah, we're blessed. I thought, praise God. You know, I, wasn't, I didn't have any fear by the grace of God. I mean, I did wonder, am I going to die tonight when I saw them picking up a big piece of asphalt? But you know what? He was, he was reminding me that, Joe, don't worry, I'm, I'm good. We're blessed. 
we're blessed. We don't have to, you know, get in the flesh. And guess what? Sometimes when we're going through times of trial, whether it's persecution or we're just going through a hard time, the enemy wants to dangle a carrot. Take a human way out. Take a, a non-biblical way out. Take a, you know, you know, and we need to remember and say, well, Lord, what's the best path to take? And at that point, now thank God they weren't hitting him in the face and stuff because then I, I would have to at least you know, put my body in there and try to stop them, you know, and get bludgeoned myself a little bit, but, or who knows what would happen. Three different police officers passed us on the way, and one of them, when they were leaving, because they wouldn't do, do anything, uh, they warned them, but they, they kept walking, but there was an interesting tension between the Orthodox Jews, the young zealots, and the, and the law enforcement there that's secular. But I threw a picture, I, you know, they thought it was a picture of them, because they said, no taking pictures. I threw a picture, I think it was of you, Kathy, is Kathy out here? She's got nursery today. Uh, I threw a picture because it was in my Bible. I don't know. It wasn't a good picture, Kathy. Don't worry. I just said, where did this picture come from? You know, it was like a distorted picture of some of the family. I just threw it on the cop's dashboard as he's taking off. And he's just like, <laughs> and they're like thinking, I think they were thinking that's a picture of us, you know. And that was just a warning, you know, that they maybe perceived that as a warning that, hey, uh, we got the goods on them if they do something wicked. But, you know, you try to think, okay, what's the best way out of a type of certain situation but ultimately, the best thing to do, and this is what you've got to do, is pray. Lord, protect us. Lord, give us wisdom. Lord, if you're going to let us die tonight, we love you. And what a way to die, man. Go in witnessing, amen? I told my sister, my sister reminded me. I go, I don't, man, it's tough. It's got to be tough getting old. I don't want to be old and then have, to have you, don't want, you don't want to grow old, right, and have other people. I mean, it happens. If you're listening, and it happens. Praise God. It's part of life. So your trial, right? But you don't want to, I'm like, I don't want people, I don't think you got it either, people to change my diapers for three years, right? So I think when I get old, if I get to that point where someone's got to change my diapers, I think I'm going to like, you know, Afghanistan or something, going witnessing, and just go be with the Lord. <laughs> she reminded me of that. I go, yeah, I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> uh, but you know what? You're in good company when you suffer for Jesus and you are blessed. In fact, listen to this. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we suffer, we will also reign with him. That's, a, that's the best quote in it, amen? We're going to reign with Christ. If we deny him, he also would deny us. Romans 8.17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Amen? Make sure if you're called to suffer for Christ, you don't try to get out of it. And one of the best things to do is recognize that you are blessed. You're blessed right now because you're in fellowship with him. And man, there's a, there's a sweetness of when you go through something and it's painful and you give it to Jesus and you seek him through it, the Holy Spirit rests upon you. It's just, there's a beauty that, that takes place there. So we look at the blessing to come because guess what? How do you think Jesus endured his suffering? He suffered. He had choices. He could have, you know, he said, Father, if possible, you know, take this cup from me. But he said, not my will, but your will be done. How did he do it? He looked at the joy before him. Not just that, but that's one way. He looked at the, listen to what it says, because he focused on the heavenly kingdom. He focused that he'd be at the right hand of the Father. He focused that he would die for our sins. He focused that he would have us as his bride forever. He focused on the outcome, and that's huge. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him. Fix your eyes on his example. For the joy set before him endured the cross. The cross was the most hellacious thing anybody could ever endure, and he endured it. How? because he looked beyond the cross at the joy that he'd have with the Father. So when you're going through an excruciating trial, don't turn on the Lord. Don't turn away. Amen? When you're going through situations, and man, it's like, man, this is really, really tough, you know? The kids aren't listening right now. And man, it'd be easy to just go off the handle and get in the flesh. Don't do it. Because there'll be joy in the future if you endure it. Endure what the Lord's allowed you to go through. Uh, he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of of faith for who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God one day we'll be the Bible, Jesus says that he'll allow us to be on his throne with him in the book of Revelation chapter 3 that's a blow mind so it's huge 1 Peter 1 13 says but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ koinonia so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed that's amazing. 
So that fellowship you have with him in your suffering, keep in mind, it's a, there's a bigger picture going on. And of course, ultimately we'll hear, well done, Jesus said, good and faithful servant, enter into the what? Joy of the Lord. Amen. That's what we're looking forward to. Number six. Number six. Peter informs us, this is very important, here's another reason to rejoice, and that why you can rejoice, that when you're going through trials. This is a beautiful one. We talked about future blessing a bit and some present blessing. Now we're talking about present blessing in the midst of your trial. Huge. Don't miss this. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are what? Blessed. Why are we blessed? Because what? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. He rests on you. That's, do you know how God made everything? The Bible says the Father created everything in, in Acts chapter 17. He's the creator of heavens and earth. The Bible says all things were made through Christ. The Bible says God sent forth his spirit and they were created. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen? Isn't that awesome? Now guess what? The Holy Spirit who created everything, who's given to us, Jesus said, as our comforter, when you're going through persecution for his namesake, he rests upon you in a special way. You know, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, Amen. In the Old Testament speaks of the Holy, the Holy Spirit resting upon the temple. Well, he rests upon us as believers. And we're going through persecution. He rests upon us. Jesus said, to go preach the gospel in all the world is witness to all the nations. Amen? And he said, and lo, I'm what? With you always to the end of the age. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, we're not going about preaching the gospel alone. We can't do it on our on our lonesome. Jesus says, go and wait and tarry in Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you in power. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. He said, go. And when you go, guess what he says is going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to give you utterance. The Holy Spirit's going to speak through you. Amen. Amen. And guess what? As we go, it's in that context. That Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And as we go, guess what it says in Revelation 22, 17? It says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, that's us, the church, say come. And let them hear, him that hears say come. And whoever will let him come and drink of the water of life freely without cost. Wow. The spirit of the bride, he's with us. He's using us, amen. And we're going through persecution. He's grieved at the wickedness that we go through, but he's there to comfort us. He's there to pour out his love, the fruit of the spirit is love and Joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness. How many would like those characteristics, those attributes when you're going through a trial? Love and peace and joy. Amen? Well, that comes from the Holy Spirit. And when you're going through persecution, He's resting upon you. And if you walk in the Spirit, you'll experience a supernatural sense of joy when everything seems like you shouldn't be because, to the world that is, because, like, wait, you're going through a horrible thing right now. How can you have joy? Because I see the big picture because the joy sent me before me, because I have the Holy Spirit, because the fruit of the Spirit is love and peace and joy and long-suffering, gentleness and goodness, because I've got Jesus, amen? And he lives in me. So you can experience that when you go through your various trials. So no matter what you're going through, seek Jesus through it, amen? Seek him. It's very, very important that we do that. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the power to confess Christ. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says this, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Holy Spirit says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to say Jesus is Lord. The world's blind to Jesus. They, he's a cuss word in the world. Amen. But we can confess Jesus Christ as our Lord. And when you sincerely say that from the heart, you can only do that by the Holy Spirit. In fact, let's together, on the count of three, say, Jesus Christ is Lord. One, two, three. Jesus Christ is Lord. You can't say that, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And mean it from the heart. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. No wonder we get persecuted. Because the, the, Jesus said the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin. 1 Corinthians 16, 8. What did Jesus do when he came here? He healed people. He fed people. He loved people. He blessed people. He cared for people like nobody has ever cared for people and loved people before. But guess what? He got a lot of people mad. The religious leaders who, were, who looked at uh, the, the Mosaic law as a means to make a bunch of money off of people, 
he went to their marketplace and he threw over their, 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 their tables. They got ticked at him. They wanted to kill him, okay? Jesus convicted people of sin. But Jesus went to be with the Father and now we're the body of Christ. Jesus said, we're the, his hands and his feet now, amen? And guess what? The Holy Spirit uses us. But guess what? John 16, 8, it says, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, how they're doing evil, and of righteousness, God's standard is Christ, and, who, and God, right? And they're falling short of that. That's that sin. And of judgment, that they're going to face God in judgment because of their sin and their, and their uh, transgression against God's holy righteousness. The world doesn't want to hear that they're sinners. They don't want to hear that they're unrighteous. They don't want to hear that there's judgment. They don't want to hear that it's wrong to murder babies by the millions, up to 62 million in our country right now. In fact, they're so ticked about that that they want to burn the Supreme Court down, right? They're so ticked about that that they're, they're, they're protesting churches okay and that's illegal by the way by the way did you know it's illegal to protest a justice's house too because you're not supposed to influence try to influence a judge you should be thrown in jail for that um, they're not being persecuted under Biden's administration or not persecuted that would just be justice they're not being uh, uh, arrested or anything you know when the wicked rule bad things happen but God's ultimately in control now it's interesting when Jesus used the word convict there, he used the Greek word elegko, okay? Elegko. And elegko means to convict, to reprove, to expose. He exposed, he convicted, he reproved the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But guess what? Did you know that now he uses the church to do that because we're his body? And that's why the secret sense of the movement doesn't want to offend everybody because they want to get really big. But guess what Jesus did? He constantly thinned out the multitudes. He'd have these huge followings after he'd feed a bunch of people. And then it says he gave them a hard saying. He'd give them a hard saying. And they'd be like, you know. He talked about counting the cost. And many would follow him no longer. Because he wanted true, sincere followers who really, truly wanted to follow him and do what's right and seek him okay now it's interesting when you look at elegco that word that jesus used of the holy spirit convicting the world of sin is used of believers who are filled with the holy spirit in the context of first corinthians 14 24 where it talks about the gifts of the spirit who god uses and speaks through that same the elegco and it talks about non-believers falling on their faces in repentance and turning to god because of the work of the holy spirit through believers and that same word and i'll give you a little uh a little quiz See if you can tell me what Greek word is, what English word is translated from elegco in this verse I'm going to tell you right now. Well, let me say the verse first. Elegco means to convict, right? To, to reprove, to expose. Ephesians 5.11. Do not have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. What Greek word do you think is elegco there? Expose expose now who's that verse written to elders pastors deacons the saints amen christians in general ephesians 5 11 you are commanded in the scripture to have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness that means movies that are pushing the occult and making witchcraft and magic look good and and pushing sexual perversion or pushing blasphemy toward god anything that's clearly unscriptural we should not be uh into right but guess what the Holy Spirit uses us, believers, to convict the world of sin. Now, how did that go over when Jesus spoke against sin and he spoke of righteousness and judgment? What did they do with Jesus? They crucified him. And Jesus says, if they persecuted me, John 15, the master, how much more will they persecute you, my, my servants, my disciples? You see, we're also going to be persecuted if we're truly following Christ. It's part of the deal. But we're blessed in the midst of it. Amen? So it's interesting uh, and the Holy Spirit rests upon us. And I want you to get your brain around that. Don't worry when you go through persecution because who knows what could happen in our lifetimes. It's going to happen. And it could become systematic. Okay, it will eventually become systematic. I don't know if in our lifetimes it'll become incredibly systematic, but it could, right? Jesus said in Mark 13, 11, when they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but it is the hell. It is who? The Holy Spirit. My daughter Holly was reading to me a story the other day. And I think it was yesterday. And she's like, wow, these school kids are, I think, were they being expelled, Holly, or just reprimanded? That we're not using the proper gender terms? 
they were being charged with sexual harassment because they wouldn't, when somebody is a guy and then pretend to be a woman and, this, and the emperor has no clothes and they're saying, you have to act, treat this person as a woman now. And if they're not doing that and they're not saying, hey, gal, or whatever, man, now you gotta, they can pick whatever gender and you get in trouble. It was, it, you can get in trouble for sexual harassment if you don't play their game and because you want to, you know, remain faithful to Christ. And when you go through really, really hard times, that's just any trial. It's not because you're following Christ, but you're just going through a trial in your life. You have a thorn in your flesh, like Paul. Like I, this is really hard to deal with. Lord, I, I, it's so painful. How do I get through this pain? Or how do I get through this sense of rejection? Or how do I get through this sense of loneliness? Or how do I get through this sense of uh, just, you know, just sometimes there's this depression. You don't know where it comes from. It can just be like a wave. You know, that, that's what happens to all of us as human beings at times. How could I get through this, Lord? And Paul had this thorn in the flesh, remember? And he prayed three times for God to take it away. And he says, concerning this in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Amen? For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I love that he gives a whole list of things. Because no matter what we're going through, what, not just persecutions, just distresses and difficulties and, and weaknesses, we're going through these things. Whatever trial you're going through, the Holy Spirit will rest upon you, and you're blessed. And his power is made what? Made perfect, plentiful in the midst of your weakness. Rely on Jesus. You're not going at it alone if you're a Christian. If you're following Jesus, you are not alone. Amen? You happen to have the best person you could possibly have around you at the time. Your creator, the maker of all things. Amen? And he lives in you. So rejoice when you're going through hard times. Number seven. I mentioned there's seven things I want to point out that Peter tells us as to why. Or ten things. We're in number seven now. We can rejoice when we're going through tough times. Going through trials. Now we're in first... Peter chapter 4. We just looked at verse 14. We're going look at verse 15. Remember, when you go through your trials, do not make dumb moves. Don't retaliate. Don't do evil things. Can't believe I'm going through this, man. I'm so depressed. I'm just going to go watch a horrible movie. You know, I just want to watch a comedy that just makes me laugh, even though I know they're blaspheming God. You know, even though I know every other word's the F word. And every, you know, even though I know they're saying, making horrific, evil, sexual, perverse jokes. You know, oh, I'm just going to do that, you know. Which, by the way, they don't have as many of those out right now, right? Because of the, the whole woke crowd, which is kind of interesting, you know. Uh, and and I, I love good humor, but the Bible warns us against coarse jesting, amen. So you've got to watch out that you don't try to find outlets to make you happy that are ungodly. I'm just real. I've got to be real, man. I know the temptations we face as Christians, okay? And sometimes it's like, well, I like this comedian, I like this comedian. And sometimes they're filthy, but because they make you laugh, you kind of set aside. If someone came in your house and started talking like that, you'd say, hey, wait a minute, man, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't talk like that here, you know? At least you'd get around to saying that. Say, hey, I love you, man, but can you stop dropping the F-bomb? But can we turn on the tube and all of a sudden it's, all of a sudden it's acceptable? Or are we just, man, I'm really down right now, man. I'm going to go get drunk and feel better. By the way, it only feel better for a little bit. Just make your problem worse. And the Bible says, don't be deceived. Drunkards will not inherit God's kingdom you won't enter God's kingdom if you're a drunkard. So it's not really wise, is it? You know, don't, don't go and say, man, this guy really got me ticked off. I can't believe what he did, man. I mean, you know, I was up for that promotion and then he spoke bad about me so I didn't get the promotion and, and he got my promotion and so forth. And, or, you know what? I couldn't make the bills meet, but you know what? I noticed that, you know, the people next door, they leave their door open, you know. They have a lot of money, so I went to go take some jewelry. God will understand no, you know what Peter says? And this is interesting, verse 15. Look what he says. Make sure that none of you suffers as what? A murderer or a, th or a thief. You say, well, of course I wouldn't go kill someone or steal something. People get tempted when they're in trials to do horrible things. Make sure that none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or evildoer. That covers just everything evil. You know, don't do evil things when you're going through your trials, right? Or a troublesome meddler. That'd be like a busybody, okay? 
You know, don't get in everybody else's weeds. Amen? If God wants to use you, and he does use us to encourage each other, strengthen each other, sometimes even have to confront each other if we see a brother in rebellion to God, but don't kick dirt up, man. And a lot of people go through suffering because of gossip, because they just, uh, they try to stir up controversy or try to stir up, uh, uh, because, you know, for whatever reasons, I don't know motives, but they'll say crazy things to just stir things up. And God's judgment is on those people, you know? on people who are gossips and people that are trying to hurt other people or cause problems, don't be that person. If you're going to suffer, don't suffer as a murderer. Don't suffer as a thief. Don't suffer as an evildoer. You know, don't suffer as a meddler or troublesome meddler or a busybody. If you're going to suffer, make sure you're suffering for Christ. Sometimes people suffer and they're going through hard times as a Christian, but they say it's a Christian, but all of a sudden you realize what they're going through. They're like, man, I'm just being persecuted for Jesus. And you realize, well, why are you being persecuted for Jesus? Now, I remember when I was a young Christian, I had a friend that fellowship with sometimes at the time, and all of a sudden he said he's being persecuted for Jesus. I go, what's going on? And I knew he was living at a home with some old folks, and I knew he was refusing to get a job for a long, long, long time. And he said, well, they called me this name, and he told me the name they called him, okay? And I think it was bugger, but I don't think they knew what bugger meant, okay? And uh, maybe they did, I don't know. And, he, and I go, why'd they call you that? He goes, they're just persecuting me for Jesus. You know what his real problem was? He was staying there. He wasn't paying his rent. And he was just staying there and refusing to get a job for a long time. And don't go around saying you're suffering for Jesus when you're doing things that make, are causing your own problems and causing your own trouble. Okay? You go and steal something from someone and say, man, I'm, it's so rough being a Christian. I'm in jail now for being a believer. <laughs> That's non sequitur, man. That's not biblical. Okay? Uh, so make sure you're suffering for Christ. First Peter three, the chapter before this, verse seventeen says, "For it's better, uh, for it is better, if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil." Amen. First Peter three seventeen is better to suffer for doing God's will than for doing evil. Okay. First uh, Peter two thirteen and fourteen says, "Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to the Lord's sake to every human institution." So we submit ourselves to every institution for the Lord's sake. He says, whether to a king as to one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the pra- that's the same word by the way and the praise of those who do right so now typically governments typically unless they just go off the reservation they're supposed to suppress evil not kill followers of Christ amen and this government the governing authorities in Paul's day they were suppressing evil but depending on the emperor, then they would persecute Christians too, which were not evil. So right now, there's unfortunately in our country, uh, now you could go, you can live in certain areas like San Francisco and so forth, and you can steal up to four hundred ninety-five dollars and not get in trouble. It's just a misdemeanor. They don't even, they don't even call, call the cops. <sighs> Is it nine ninety-five? Yeah, you can steal nine ninety-five, nine ninety-nine actually, as long as you don't hit a thousand. Man, you can rip people off and everything else and. You can protest at, you know, try to influence judges at their courts as long as it's uh, conservative judges you're trying to persecute. And, you know, you can kill babies in mass, so they're not, pers- they're not against murder in our country, on, depending on who you murder. As long as you're murdering the most innocent people, it's okay. The unborn babies, you know, the most defenseless. Uh, we li- our country is becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. But you want to make sure you don't suffer for doing what is wrong. Number eight, don't be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Verse 16. Verse 16. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, suffers as a what? Christian. I love that word, Christian. I love it. It's just, to me, one of the most beautiful words. If anyone suffers as a Christian, to follow Christ, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. If you're suffering as a Christian, don't be ashamed of your faith. Don't be ashamed of Jesus, but rejoice in his name. So don't be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Amen. Number eight, don't be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Jesus said, Luke 9, 26, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. If you're ashamed of him through suffering and you just don't want to suffer because you're ashamed of his name, you're going to go through hell later. He'll be ashamed of you. 
Paul said in Romans 1 16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it's the power of God is salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek amen now the word Christian anybody know I'm sure a few of you know a little trivia question how many times is the word Christian used in the Bible come on come on three times who said that good job Jimmy three times can you give him a star over there thank you <laughs> good job Jimmy three times man and you know what it's almost it's pretty much used in a pejorative sense every time as though it's a name that we are called by non-believers and Christians began to adopt that name just like the cross was like the worst symbol in the world because it had to do with death and crucifixion and of criminal acts but since the innocent one God himself became a man and died on the cross for us it's become a blessed symbol for us amen and the name Christian was like a cuss word in the first century. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 11 that the disciples were first called Christians. They were being called Christians by the lost people in Antioch. That's where they were first called Christians in Antioch. Then we read that King Agrippa, listen to what King Agrippa says when Paul, is, the apostle, is before him testifying about Christ. Agrippa replied to Paul, in such a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian? So the world used that word of believers. Now we sing, they will know we are Christians by our love. Amen. It's a beautiful, I, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, praise God. I rejoice in that name. I love that name. Amen. So now it's interesting. We're to wear it as a badge of honor, you know, the, uh, for the one that made us and loved us and redeemed us. Now it's interesting that that name, Jesus Christos, uh, Jesus Christos in uh, the Greek. That name Jesus in the Greek was just battered and pummeled and, 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 Jesus, and when it was with Christ. In fact, it's interesting. I was reading recently a liberal, he was, he's called the high priest of the liberal left in Israel for years before he died. And he wrote a, uh, or there's a book about him called I Wanted to Ask You, Professor Leibowitz. And his name is uh, Yesha Yahu Leibowitz and he was the high priest of the religious left you know the orthodox left on the left side there and he said in that book it says of him he said we curse christianity three times every day uh did you know when you go to israel did you know if you ask them if they know what the name of jesus is in hebrew you know what they'll say what do you think they'll say they won't say yeshua some of them will say yeshua but most secular jews will say yeshu 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 is not his name. His name is Yeshua. Yeshua. Now it's interesting. Yeshu is an acronym. It's not even really a Hebrew name. It's an acronym that was written by Jews centuries ago. And that was the main name used of Jesus by the Jews, secular Jews. You know what it means? It's an acronym that's it's an acronym that spells out words which mean, I should say that stand for words that mean, may his name and memory be blotted out forever no kidding most secular Jews they'll, they'll say Yeshu a lot of you don't even know what it means they just think that's his name in Hebrew <laughs> Yeshua means what God is salvation amen Yeshu is an acronym may his name and memory be blotted out forever are you starting to understand the persecution that believers could face in communist countries and in Islamic countries and then even in Israel they, they were being heavily heavily persecuted in fact it's interesting when you go through the book of Acts they were being persecuted by, by both Jews and Gentiles okay you go through that you see it over and over again now it's interesting because you say well that's horrible and when I mentioned what it meant a lot of you are like whoa well how horrible is this when you hear the name of Jesus at work how do you usually hear it as a cuss word amen it replaces the word S-H-I-T or F-U-C-K or whatever. It's just another cuss word. It's just, it's just they, they, they use whatever. His name is a cuss word. How does that happen? Because the prince and the power of the air, the spirit of Antichrist that's in the demonic entities that are all around inspiring people to hate on Jesus. And guess what? They're there to inspire people to hate on you too. But you don't have a complex like, oh no, I'm going to be hated on. I'm just going to go to work like this. No, you say, man, I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed of his name. And I'm just going to lovingly be a cool person. I'm not going to be outrageously ridiculous and you know, obnoxious, but I'm not going to be sit on my hands ever and never talk about Jesus. I'm going to be who I am in Christ. Amen? That's who the Lord wants us to be. Amen? You know, it's interesting. About, uh, I don't know, the early apologist, Justin Martyr, 
he wrote his second apology about 100 years after this was written, 1 Peter. And in chapter 2 of his second apology, he was one of the top church fathers, top apologists, him and Irenaeus in the second century, not long after Christ. He write, writes about uh, Ptolemaeus, who was a church leader in Rome. And he writes about Ptolemaeus, and he writes about him as a church leader in Rome and how he was persecuted because he led a noble woman to Christ. And her husband got so angry that she wasn't following the Roman gods and she was following the Lord Jesus Christ that he was so angry at Ptolemaeus, this church leader in Rome, in the second century, that Justin Martyr, in his second apology, says that he had a centurion, a Roman centurion, go to his house, knock, and ask one simple question. Are you a Christian? His answer, I am a Christian. Arrested. Tortured. Put on trial. It was on trial. The witnesses said that he was a Christian. Then they asked him again, are you a Christian? He said, I am a Christian. The judge became irate. Okay? And a man that was there at the trial named Lucius, he said this. <laughs> Lucius uh, sprang to his feet and said, quote, what is the basis of the, for the judgment? Why have you punished this man not as an adulterer, nor a fornicator, nor a murderer, nor a thief, nor a robber, nor convicted of any crime at all, but who has only confessed that he is called by the name of Christian. And Justin Martyr writes, and he said nothing else in answer to Lucius's uh, statement than this, quote, you also seem to me to be such a one, that is a judge. And when Lucius answered, most certainly I am, he again ordered him to be led away and, and professed and he, uh, the man who was led away, Lucius, he professed his thanks to knowing that he had been delivered to such wicked rulers and was going to the Father and King of the heavens. And still a third, having come forward, was condemned to be punished. And another guy stepped up. Oh, I'm a Christian too. Would, would that be you? Or you'd be like, I ain't getting persecuted. I, mean, I love Jesus and all, but man, I don't want to miss, you know, the Sunday social we're having after service, you know? You don't want to do that. So Tacitus, okay, He's a Roman ruler. He became emperor in 79. He was, you remember Tacitus, I bring him up sometimes because he was a Roman general who had, the temple was destroyed under him and he sacked Jerusalem when after Christ was rejected in 70 AD, Jerusalem was sacked and he was a general ruling that. After Vespasian or Vespian, it's pronounced, people pronounce his name different ways, after he uh, was his father and then he ended up becoming emperor and then he died and then his son Tacitus became the emperor. Well, guess what? He wrote to, uh, and this is after Nero. Nero was having Christians killed, and a lot of accounts have Nero taking Paul's head off. Well, it's interesting. Tacitus, uh, when he was writing, I'm sorry, uh, when Tacitus was uh, emperor, he used words of Christians that were only used today, or of, of pedophiles. He said of Christians that... Uh, that, that the, the pagans, the Roman, ordinary Romans love to see them slaughtered because, quote, they're notoriously depraved and because, quote, the whole human race detests them. And he hoped for an end to their, quote, deadly superstition. Wow. Number nine. Number nine. We want to praise and glorify God in our trials. Amen? We want to praise and glorify God in our trials. And we read that next. And uh, let's go ahead and look at verse, First Timothy chapter four, First Peter chapter four, verse sixteen. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to what? Glorify God in this name. We ought to glorify God in this name. Amen. The NIV has it this way. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Amen. We need to not make sure we don't blaspheme his name, that we don't deny his name, but that we praise his name. That's what Peter's preaching here. And Peter walked his talk. Listen to Acts chapter 5, verse 40. After they were whipped and told, don't you come back into the city and witness again, or you're dead meat. They took his advice, and after calling, that's not Peter's advice, this is the Jewish council, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them, that is, they whipped them, and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, sad that they had to suffer for Christ? No. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer for shame for his name. Amen? Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Amen? 
You guys, think of the three men that suffered the worst. Come on. And they still praised God. The three men on my list that suffered the worst, and if they didn't suffer the worst, at least Jesus, we got him as number one, right? But I have Job as number two, and I have Joseph as number three. Joseph suffered, right, radically. He was rejected by his family. Can you imagine? You're a young son, and you're rejected by all your other brothers, hated upon them, put you in a pit, they're going to kill you. There's no, there's hard, it's hard to find greater pain than being rejected by your own loved ones. And then he sold into slavery, right? And his father knows, uh, there's a lot of suffering. But he says in chapter 50, what you guys meant for evil, he praises God. God meant for good, amen? He's able to still praise him. And when we're persecuted by our own family members, and you'll be betrayed, it says, by children and by parents and so forth, for your faith at times, you know? What do you need to do? You need to rejoice. Joseph was able to. Number, that's number three. Number two on my list is Job. Can you think of anyone besides Jesus who suffered more than Job? Head to toe, boils, demonically attacked, his family wiped out except for his wife left alive so she could nag him almost to death, right? So you get this ugly situation, right? And guess what? Job rejoiced. And what did Job say in Job, in Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 21? It says, Then Job rose and tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshipped. That's what you do when you're in trial. You still choose to worship God. Amen? He said, Naked have I come in from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. That doesn't mean he's unreal. That doesn't mean he didn't say, God, why is this happening to me at times? He did. But then he returned to praise. And he recognized, woo, I better be careful. And then God blessed him twice as much as before he went through what he went through. And did Jesus go through some heavy stuff? Jesus went through heavier stuff than anybody ever went through. Suffered more than anybody. He took all of our sins upon himself on the cross. And we, we're familiar with those verses. My, my, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I poured out like water. This is all in uh, chapter 22 of Psalms. My bones are out of joint. My heart melts like wax you know, within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. You lay in me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Yet listen to the praise just a few verses later in the same Psalm when he was on the cross. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. And he goes on. He went back to praise. Praise God in the midst of your trials. And tell him, Father, even though it doesn't feel good right now, I know you're in control, and I know you're good, and I know you love me because you've said you do, and you've shown that on the cross. Amen? And rejoice in him. Amen? Number 10. Number 10. Judgment day is coming. Judgment day is coming, and you will be vindicated for all the evil suffering that you've gone through. Go ahead and look at chapter 4, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And it is with difficulty that the right, and if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Amen. So number 10, entrust your soul to the creator because he will vindicate you in the end, amen? And no matter what you go through here, God's gonna make it right in the end. And the wicked people that do wicked things against God's elect, Jesus will come and judge them one day, amen? But the thing is, don't say, hooray, he's gonna judge all the wicked. Remember, you were once there. Pray that they get saved so they don't have to get judged, Amen. And you say, what does that mean? That starts first, that ju uh, judgment starts first at the household of God. Well, guess what? When we get caught up to meet the Lord in the air, right? At the second coming of Christ. Okay, we come and reign with him. But before we reign, guess what he does? He judges us and gives us according to our works. And guess what? The wicked aren't judged until lake of fire over a thousand years later. Okay? They go to hell when they die, but they don't stand before the great judgment until that time. Can we pass out the cup and the bread? Are you with me today? Do we, do we follow that? Praise God. Let's all pass out the cup and the bread. And uh, stand, please. The Bible says to stand in awe of him. That's an easy thing to do, right? If you can stand, that is. <laughs> Thank you, bro. What an awesome God we have. As they're passing out the cup and the bread, I'm going to pray. You don't, you're like, wait, I have to keep my eyes open because of cutting the bread and There's no verse in the Bible that says close your eyes when you pray. Did you know that? So don't worry about it. <laughs> Father God, we love you so much and we thank you so much. And 
We pray, Father, if there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, who hasn't been saved, that they'd recognize how good you are, how much you care about them, how much you love them, how you sent your son into the world. And Jesus, as the second person of the triune Godhead, that became a man, and as a God-man, God in the flesh, loved us so much he went to the cross after living a perfect life to bear the penalty that we deserve upon himself and take upon us the punishment of sin and that he was buried after he died and rose again and conquered the grave and sin and death and hell and Satan. We thank you for that, Father, so that we can have eternal life. We thank you for your word that says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Brothers and sisters, if you, don't, if you know Jesus, praise God, then you're in the kingdom of God, praise God. If you have not turned to the Lord Jesus Christ yet, and you are not saved, you need to make sure you leave here your, you your saved because you don't know when your time's coming. You don't know when you're going to die. Your life is indeed like a vapor, and he loves you guys. So if you don't know Jesus, cry out to him in your heart. God's word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He'll save you this very moment, amen? If you're listening by live stream, and you haven't turned to Jesus yet, go to him right now. If you're listening right now and you haven't been handling your trials the right way and you haven't been praising God but you've been whining and moaning and complaining in the midst of them all, blaming God, don't do that, man. The Bible says, woe to the one who quarrels or argues with his maker. God's always right. We're always wrong. Say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust myself to a creator who loves me and cares for me as your word commands. Thank you. Father God, we thank you for the bread which represents your son's body. It was given on the cross for us unleavened bread even as his body was without sin we partake of this bread and remember what Jesus did on the cross in your son's name amen Father God we thank you for the cup of blessing cup of thanksgiving we give you thanks Father for your son's shed blood which this cup the sweet fruit of the vine represents we're so grateful that Jesus died to pay for our sins and your great love. They went through the worst trial possible. So the trials that are little that we go to by way of comparison could make us more like him. So we could be saved by his blood and be conformed to his image. We partake of the cup with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God, you guys. We have an awesome God. Hey, do we have a lot of reasons to rejoice in our trials? We went through 10 of them that Peter gives us by the Holy Spirit. Let's give the Lord thanks for saving us. Amen. <laughs> praise you, Lord. We love you, Father God. We praise your holy name. Praise the Lord, you guys. We love you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you his perfect peace. Uh, Chad's up here and Nick. We've got a couple of the elders up here to pray with you right here and here. If you need prayer, I'm up here as well if you need prayer. Uh, love you guys. Press on in Jesus. Give somebody a big hug. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful day in the Lord.